American Masters, hosted by Joanne Woodward, is made possible by the National Endowment for the Arts, this station and other public television stations, and Rosalind P. Walter. Funding for this special presentation in the humanities was provided by the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Pew Memorial Trust. Hello, I'm Joanne Woodward. The critic Brooks Atkinson once wrote that playwright Eugene O'Neill helped translate the theater into an art seriously related to life. Makes sense, because O'Neill was brilliant, complicated, a troubled man whose greatest love was to write. And so from out of these ingredients came the power to change the face of American theater. O'Neill was our Strindberg, our Ibsen, yes, maybe even our Shakespeare. He wrote A Long Day's Journey in Tonight, A Moon for the Misbegotten, Strange Interlude, Morning Becomes Electra, and The Iceman Cometh, among others. O'Neill was the only American playwright to win the Nobel Prize for Literature. He also received the Pulitzer Prize on four occasions. Prizes are very nice, but the most important recognition for a playwright comes from performance of his works. And rarely is there a time when one of O'Neill's 38 plays is not being performed somewhere. In this first of two programs on Eugene O'Neill, I think you will understand why he remains to this day one of our most enduring playwrights. Hey, give me a whiskey, huh? ginger ale on the side. And don't be stingy, baby. Anna Christie has power and humor, notable in vision, writing, and acting. The play is a hoax. The ending is not a blunder, but a crime. You don't have to give a damn about anything anymore. You have finally got the game of life licked. The Iceman Cometh is one of O'Neill's best plays. He writes with the wonder and heart of a poet. The action draggeth, the dialogue reeketh, the play stinketh. The hairy ape is monstrously uneven, worthless and overwrought. She was a wise that I was in a cage, too. It is a powerful and shattering play from Eugene O'Neill. Long Day's journey into night contains his usual weaknesses, and it never touches the heart. The past. How can I? The past is the present, isn't it? It's the future, too. We all try to lie out of that, but life won't let One us... One of the great dramas of any time. The theater must give us what the church no longer gives us, a meaning. The theater can reveal to us what we are. We have had enough of life invading the theater. It is time the theater invaded life. <laughs> In 1917, I met Agnes Bolton in Greenwich Village. She was then 24 years old, pretty, and clever enough to write novelettes for pulp magazines. She was fascinated by artists and writers. We were sitting in the Hell Hall, one of those village saloons, and my friend Christine introduced me to Jean O'Neill. He had on this seaman sweater under his jacket and a suit that obviously had been slept in. He had a disturbing look in his eyes, both sad and cruel. Later, he walked me across Washington Square to the Brevoort, where I lived, and he suddenly said, quite earnestly, I want to spend every night of my life from now on with you. I mean it, every night of my life. And six months later, we were married. 
Carlotta Monterey was an actress in The Hairy Ape when it moved to Broadway in 1922. I didn't think much of her then. But some years later, when we met again, I saw in her mother and wife and mistress and friend. Don't sentimentalize him. He was not a sweet little boy searching for a mama or a young man ever so polite. He was a black Irishman, a rough, tough black Irishman. He could have that smile that made him seem so young. And other times he'd be as old as an old Oriental. He was interested only in writing his plays. And God, he was stubborn. I can't for the life of me recall much about my first meeting with George Jean Nathan, but I believe I was three-fourths blotto. He was known as a dandy, an iconoclast, and a self-professed hedonist. But as a dramatic critic, he had no peers. Where I expected an aloof, caustic critic, I found Nathan warm, friendly, and human. We remained lifetime friends. In all the many years of our friendship, I have known Eugene O'Neill to laugh aloud once, and only once, and it was over some rumored incident when he was at Princeton that he threw an Anheuser Busch beer bottle into Woodrow Wilson's window. In all the years I've known him, the most that ever issued from him was a quiet little chuckle twice. But then he has a dislike for meeting people that amounts almost to terror. I sort of looked toward Kenneth McGowan as a mentor. He was a brilliant creative man and a fine drama critic. Soon after we met in 1921, I wrote him, I feel somehow that we were fated for a real friendship. In 30 years, nothing was to change that opinion. O'Neill is a kind of uh, chain-stitch playwright. Now, I don't mean by this that you have only to, to yank at the thread of his story in some weak spot to see the whole thing ravel out. No, I mean that his ideas and technique developed through a long chain of links bound inextricably to one another. They develop slowly, but they develop inevitably from his first plays to his last. In 1916 came the first reviews of a play by Eugene Gladstone O'Neill titled Bound the East for Cardiff at the Provincetown Playhouse, Greenwich Village. Only two critics came. The author strikes a true vein in his successful mounting of the true talk of seamen. The play is real, subtly tense. This young man is a writer to watch. I predict that one day the world shall make a path to his door. Nothing in the American theater seems to me so shrouded and transfigured in the mists of memory as the Provincetown players of the great days. Now, those days ended when Jig Cook went to Greece and Eugene O'Neill went to Broadway. But it all really started in the summer of 1915 up at Cape Cod. Provincetown, Massachusetts, was an old fishing town. Portuguese fishermen, mostly. Provincetown was discovered by a small group of artists and writers from Greenwich Village. It had two main streets, Commercial Street and Bradford Street. Jig Cook and Susan Glassbell kept a cottage not far from one of the wharves. And Jig and I kept open house for everyone. And one night we were sitting around and we were talking about what was wrong with the commercial theater. And we decided that we wanted to put on plays that we ourselves had written. Oh, let's see who was there. Jack Reed, Louise Bryant, Wilbur Daniel Steele, Hutch Hapgood and Neath Boyce, and Bobby Jones. Our first plays were done right in Neath Boyce's living room. Then we found an old fishing shack over a wharf to use as a theater. We put on four one-act plays that first season. The next summer, by the second bill, we ran out of plays. And we were searching for something to put on. 
Someone mentioned a young man called Eugene O'Neill, who was in Provincetown with a trunk full of plays. The next night, O'Neill, a dark, shy boy, came around with a copy of Bound East for Cardiff. He was too shy to read it himself, and he went into the next room while one of us read it aloud. When the reading had finished, we knew what we were for. I may see it through memories too emotional, but I never sat before a more moving production than our Bound East for Cardiff, when Eugene O'Neill was produced for the first time on any stage. The sea has been good to him. It was there for his opening. There was a fog, just as the script demanded. A tide washed under us. Gang, <coughs> Gang, what is it? I'll run for the captain. No, no, don't leave me, Trisk. For God's sake, don't leave me. I won't leave you, Yank. I won't leave you. How will the fog get in here? Fog? Everything's getting misty. Must be my eyes are getting weak, I guess. What was we talking about a moment ago? Uh, Argentine. Uh. You remember? Huh? Remember the times we've spent in Buenos Aires? Huh? The moving pictures in Baracus? Uh, some class to them. You remember? Hey, uh, I, I do that. And so does the piano player. I... Uh, he'll not be forgetting the black eye I gave him in a hurry, huh? <laughs> <laughs> oh, and, and the days when we used to sit on the park benches along the Paseo Colon and and uh, the vigilantes uh, looking hard at us. Uh, and, and, and the songs uh, at the Sailor's Opera. And the guy used to play the ragtime, huh? Do you remember? I do, sure. <laughs> And La Plata. Huh? Oh, the, the stink of the hides. I always liked Argentine. All except that booze, Kanye. Oh, how drunk we used to get on that. You remember? Huh? Don't be thinking about all that now. It is past and gone. All past and gone. <laughs> I would say that in almost half his plays, the, the sea plays an important role. Most of his early sea characters had their living counterparts. O'Neill boozed and bumped and battled with them. When he spoke to me of those days, his face just lit up. I was on the docks in Boston watching all the clipper ships and square riggers going out to sea. I looked out at the bay and wondered what was beyond that horizon, and I knew then that I must go to sea. I wanted to be a two-fisted he-man sailor, to knock him cold. So I sailed on the Charles Racine out of Boston Harbor, bound for Buenos Aires. What a thrill of release it gave me to feel the great ocean ground swell start to heave the ship under me. It meant freedom, an end of an old episode and the birth of another. The sea filled me with a religious ecstasy, a sense of being in mystical communion with the secret heart of things. Conrad said, the true peace of God begins at any spot a thousand miles from the nearest land. I say amen to that. It never left his blood. He never stopped recalling those sea years. They meant everything. I once said to him, half jokingly, I've dragged you all over Europe. I've worked like anything to show you all the beautiful spots. And I've never heard you once say that you like this or that or the other. Well, he said, I liked them, but they weren't very exciting. The men he knew and met at sea are to be seen in all those early plays. The Moon of the Caribbees, the, the Long Voyage Home. There was a Smitty, a, a Yank, a Cocky, an Olson. And the SS Glen Cairn was a, 
was the Charles Racine, the ship that sailed to Buenos Aires. I landed in Buenos Aires a gentleman, so-called, with ten bucks in my pocket and wound up a bum on the docks. I doubt if there was a park bench I didn't sleep on in Buenos Aires. In one night, I spent my last ten bucks at a waterfront saloon called the Sailor's Opera. You could describe the place as a madhouse. The clientele had a bottomless thirst for booze that matched my own. Everyone there was expected to contribute something like a song. If your voice cracked, your head usually did too. If you add up all the flop houses, bordellos, ballrooms, and waterfronts where he spent his time, you can see how this made O'Neill a seer of life and eventually a revolutionist in the theater instead of a well-bred literary man. In a few years, the son of a great and popular American actor touched the bottom of civilization, suffered and starved, and brought body and soul to the brink of destruction. How he came out of all this to become a great playwright is one of the miracles of modern literature. In 1911, after three more voyages as a seaman, he returned to New York and began living at a Hudson River waterfront dive called Jimmy the Priests. What a miserable joint that was. But you could get a shot of whiskey for only a nickel. Located on Fulton Street near the Washington Market, it was a haven for sailors, anarchists, prostitutes, and uh, assorted lower-depth denizens. The stink was outrageous. I lived there among the derelicts, bums, and lungers. A lunger was someone who spat blood onto the stove in the back room. One couldn't go any lower, and except for the small allowance from my father that hardly paid for my booze, I was absolutely flat broke. In The Iceman Cometh, Larry Slade describes such a place. What is it? It's the No Chance Saloon. It's Bedrock Bar. The end of the line cafe. The bottom of the sea of Rathscaller. Oh. Don't you notice the... The beautiful calm in the atmosphere. That's because it's the last harbor. No one here has to worry about where they're going next. Because there's no farther they can go. All these people and experiences became the material for the first plays that brought him critical attention, including my own. Perhaps if he hadn't drunk as much as he did, hadn't mixed with so many kinds of people in those early days, we might not have his plays. But Gene had hit rock bottom at Jimmy the Priest's. The liquor was no longer enough for him. He decided on suicide as the only way out. He went to several drugstores and bought enough veronal to kill himself. He swallowed the pills and, like Socrates, lay down in his bed waiting for death to come. Ah, my brain was nuts then. If anyone suggested that I climb up the Woolworth building, I'd have been tickled to death to do it. Although you might say he had a definite death wish, he did not take enough Veronal to do the job properly. Two of his cronies found him and rushed him off to a hospital where he was revived. Somewhere in a letter to Carlotta, he speaks of his seeking flight which is an interesting idea, that he was running from something in search of something all his life. And it was a flight that didn't know what it was running from, really, or what it was looking for. He'd been briefly married, he'd had a child by that marriage, and then uh, that had been broken up. And, he'd, uh, and, and there were so many things in which uh, that the, the were essentially totally without stability. I never did find out how I boarded that train for New Orleans. I woke up because it was the last stop. It was not by chance his father was playing a vaudeville tour of the Count of Monte Cristo there. But instead of giving Gene his return fare to New York, he gave him a role in the show. To eat or not to eat, that is the question for you, my boy. I am not satisfied with your performance. Sir, I am not satisfied with your play. 
Watch me. Watch me and learn acting. I can still see my father in Monte Cristo rising from a canvas sea shouting, The world is mine. Yes, in those days, virtue always triumphed, and vice always got its just desserts. Someone once wrote about O'Neill. The artificiality of the theater of his father repelled him. Yet, when he began to write, it was for the theater. The trouble with people writing about me is that I don't believe there is anyone who knows me intimately in more than one phase of a life that has passed through many distinct periods. To get to know the real truth about me, you have to go back, back to the beginning where it started, the beginning. And even then, the answers seem to contradict each other. My mother was beautiful. Everyone said she was. I remember her hair, copper brown and bronze gold, and her deep brown eyes with the long curling lashes and those black brows. Her most appealing quality was her simple charm and her unworldly innocence. She seldom smiled, but when she was happy, there was a kind of gay Irish lilt to her voice. She was born in New Haven, Connecticut, and raised in Cleveland, Ohio. Ella Quinlan was a devout Catholic. She went to St. Mary's College near South Bend, Indiana. She remembered those years as the happiest time of her life. In Long Day's journey into night, O'Neill's portrait of his mother is amazingly accurate. He calls her Mary Tyrone. If you think that Mr. Tyrone is handsome now, Kathleen, you should have seen him when I first met him. He had the reputation for being one of the best-looking men in the whole country. And the girls in the convent who had seen him act or who had seen photographs of him used to just rave about him. So you could imagine how excited I was when my father wrote me that he and James Tyrone had become friends and that I was to meet him when I went home for the Easter vacation. I showed the letter to all the girls, how envious they were. My father took me to see him act first. I couldn't take my eyes off him. And then, right after the play, my father took me backstage to his dressing room. I was really very pretty then, Kathleen. And he... He was handsomer than my wildest dream. He wasn't like any ordinary man. He was like someone from another world. And yet he was simple and kind and unassuming. Not the least bit stuck up or vain. I fell in love right then. He did too. He told me afterwards... And I forgot all about being a nun or a concert pianist. All I wanted was to be his wife. Ella was 14 when she met James O'Neill, that actor. When she was 18, she married him. This house, the Monte Cristo Cottage in New London, Connecticut, is where the family spent much of their free time and is the setting for O'Neill's openly autobiographical play. At the convent... I had so many friends. Girls whose families lived in lovely homes. And I used to visit them, and they'd visit me in my father's home. But naturally, after I married an actor, you know how actors were considered in those days? All my old friends either pitied me or cut me dead. I hated the ones who cut me much less and the piteous. James O'Neill literally swept her off her feet. He, too, was a devout Catholic born in Ireland. He came from miserably poor people in Kilkenny, but the family managed to emigrate to America. Oh, what a brogue I had in those early days. I got rid of it. I was my own teacher. I never took a lesson in vocal culture in my life. Mm. Now, one day, I got a role in Rip Van Winkle, starring the great Joseph Jefferson. He was a grand performer. And finally, later, the supreme artist of them all, Edwin Booth. Oh, I was so fortunate. I dressed like Booth. I walked like him. I 
pose like him. And finally, I came to speak like him. The day came when I was to play Othello opposite Booth's Iago. It was the big chance. Ursula, he came to me and he said, of course, this is your scene, O'Neill, but I will be at your side whenever you want me. On opening night, after we had finished the big scene and the curtain had fallen, he called me back and he said, that scene is yours. And then he said to our manager, that young man plays Othello better than I ever did. I was 27 years old. It was the greatest moment of my life. The O'Neills toured America. James starred in a repertoire of leading roles. Then one day, James O'Neill discovered a play called Monte Cristo, in which he would play the leading role of Edmond Dantes. That role became decisive in the life and fortunes of James O'Neill. He bought the play and performed it over 4,000 times on stage and in a 1912 silent film. O'Neill becomes James Tyrone in Long Day's Journey Into Night. A goddamn play I bought for a song and made such a great success in, a great money success. Ruined me. This promise of an easy fortune. I didn't want to do anything else. And by the time I woke up to the fact I'd become a slave to the damn thing and did try other plays, it's too late. I'd lost the great talent I once had through years of easy repetition, never learning a new part, never really working hard. Thirty-five to forty thousand dollars net profit a season, like snapping your face. It's too great a temptation. Yet, before I bought the damn thing, I was considered one of the three or four young actors with the greatest artistic promise in America. Uh, what the hell was it I wanted to buy, I wonder, that was worth? Oh, no matter. Late day for regrets. On my solemn oath, Edmund, I'd gladly face not having an acre of land to call my own, nor a penny in the bank. I'd be willing to have no home but the poorhouse in my old age. If I could look back now on having been the fine artist, I might have been. During the O'Neill's 1878 tour, their first child was born, James O'Neill, Jr., Jamie, they called him, and they doted on that child. There was a second child born. His name was Edmund. Now, when James went on tour, the two children were often left at home with relatives. In Long Day's Journey Into Night, the playwright, reversing the names, called himself Edmund, and this second child, who died in infancy, he called Eugene. I was so healthy before Edmund was born. You remember, James? Even traveling with you season after season, with week after week of one-night stands, in trains without Pullmans, in dirty rooms of filthy hotels, eating bad food, bearing children in hotel rooms. I still kept healthy, but bearing Edmund was the last straw. I, I was so sick afterwards, and then that, that ignorant quack of a cheap hotel doctor, all he knew was I was in pain, it was easy to stop the pain. Mary, for God's sake, forget the past. How can I? The past is the present. 
isn't it? It's the future, too. We all try to lie out of that, but life won't let us. I swore after Eugene died that I would never have another baby. I was to blame for his death. Because if I hadn't left him with my mother to join you on the road, then Jamie would never have been allowed while he still had measles to go into the baby's room. I've always believed that Jamie did that on purpose. He was jealous of the baby. He hated him. Oh, Mary. I know he was only seven, but Jamie was never stupid. He'd been warned it might kill the baby. He knew. I've never been able to forgive Jamie for that. Are you back with Eugene can't you let our dead baby rest in peace? It was my fault. I should have insisted on staying with Eugene. I should never have let you persuade me to join you just because I loved you. And above all, I shouldn't have let you insist that I have another baby to take Eugene's place. Because I knew I'd prove, by the way, that I have left him. That I wasn't worthy to have another baby and I, God would punish me if I did. I never should have born Edmund. But Mary! You be careful with your talk. If he heard you, he might think you never wanted him. He's feeling bad enough already. Oh, no, that's a lie. I did want him more than anything in the world. You don't understand. I meant for his sake. He's never been happy nor ever will be, nor healthy. He was born too nervous and sensitive, and that's my fault. In October 1888, Eugene Gladstone O'Neill was born in the Barrett House, a theatrical hotel on Times Square, New York City, then called Longacre Square. I remember my father pointing it out to me. My first seven years were spent on tour with my parents with Monte Cristo. I knew only actors and the stage, and my mother nursed me in the wings and in dressing rooms. In the summer, and when my father was not on tour, we usually lived in New London, Connecticut. It was the only real home I ever knew when I was young. I loved to sit outdoors with a book and dream. I loved to draw pictures of the boats that sailed by on the Thames River. I loved hearing my mother's piano playing from the house in the distance. Most of all, I loved the sure presence of my family being there. Papa, my brother Jamie, my nurse Sarah, and more than anyone else, Mama. She was the most beautiful woman in the world. I was very proud of Mama then. Two days before his seventh birthday, Eugene O'Neill began a rigid Christian exile. His father, devout Catholic, enrolled Eugene in the St. Aloysius Academy for Boys in the Riverdale section of the Bronx. He was there almost five years. He felt abandoned, betrayed, unloved by the very ones dearest to him, his father, his nurse, but above all, his mother. And he tried to find in Jesus a substitute for the love of his mother. We were both raised as little convent boys. He once said to me, remember how Sister Mary used to paddle your behind to the chime of the Angelus and never miss a beat? When he was 15, his mother tried to drown herself in the river when she was deprived of the drugs she needed. The horror of this discovery of her drug addiction turned him violently against a god that could let such things happen. His rejection of Catholicism would hound him for the rest of his life. He had resigned himself to damnation. He was gradually to become a renegade Catholic in search of redemption. O'Neill's relationship to his mother was pathetic. But there's always a sense in his plays, or at least in many of his plays, of a mother who, in one way or another, is absent or who has failed the child, and the, the, the son must find some surrogate for a mother, find it in a prostitute, find it in a belief, uh, all the men in strange interlude, wanting to find a kind of maternal goddess in Nina Leeds, Hickey and his wife Evelyn, and the Iceman cometh, and play after play. 
this idea of the mother becomes an obsessive thing. Betts Academy in Connecticut was not a parochial school. He did well in his studies and enjoyed life at Betts. I entered Princeton, but didn't last more than a year there. Some of my fellow students were surprised I lasted that long. When I was 19 and still at Princeton, I saw my first performance of an Ibsen play, Hedda Gabler, starring Nazimova. I saw it ten times and discovered an entire new world of the drama, a theater where truth might live. A few years later, the Abbey Theater players arrived from Dublin, performing in plays by Yeats and Singh. I saw 14 performances. They were great, and they were Irish. The Haymarket area of New York, on 6th Avenue in the West 30s, provided him with his sexual initiation. His brother Jamie first took him to one of these houses of ill repute, an experience that was more painful to him than he had expected. Do you know why Gene learns sin more easily than other people? Because his brother made it easy for him. He was forced to go into these houses by Jamie. Girls were such terrible creatures. They forced whiskey down his throat with Jamie's help and they tore off his clothes. He just wasn't ready for that. His brother Jamie had everything going for him. He was handsome, clever, his parents adored him, and he had a brilliant mind. But in the end, his whole life was wasted on liquor, prostitutes, and a bitter hatred for the world. Jamie's ambivalence toward his younger brother finally emerges in this scene from Long Day's Journey into Night. I want to warn you against me. Mom and Papa are right. I've been a rotten bad influence. And the worst of it is, I did it on purpose. Shut up. I don't want to Next hear Next kid, listen. I did it on purpose to make a bum of you. Part of me did. Big part. Part that's been dead so long. That hates life. My putting you wise so you learn from my mistakes. I believe that myself at times, but it's a fake. Made my mistakes look good. Made getting drunk, romantic, made whores, fascinating vampires instead of the poor, stupid, diseased slobs they really are. Made fun of work, suckers game. Never wanted you to succeed. Make me look even worse by comparison. Wanted you to fail. Always jealous of you. Mama's baby, Papa's pet. I was your being born started my mind, dope. I know it's not your fault, but all the same, God damn you, I can't help hitting your guts. Jamie, cut it out. You're crazy. Don't get the wrong idea, kid. No, oh, I love you more than I hate you. My, my saying what I'm telling you now proves it. I, I run the risk you'll hate me, and you're all I got left. I didn't mean to tell you that last stuff. I'd go that far back. I don't, don't know why it made me. What I wanted to say is... I'd like to see you become the greatest success in the world, but be on your guard because I'll do my damnedest to make you fail. I can't help it. I hate myself. The dead part of me hopes you won't get well. Maybe he's even glad that the, the game's got mama again. He, he wants company. He doesn't want to be the only corpse around the house. Jesus, Jamie, you really have gone crazy. You think it over. You'll see I'm right. You think it over when you're away from me up in the sanatorium. Make up your mind. You gotta tie a can to me. Get me out of your life. Think of me as dead. Tell people, I had a brother, but he's dead. When you come back, you look out for me. I'll be ready to welcome you with that my old pal stuff. Give you the glad hand. And the first good chance I get, stab you in the back. Shut up! I'll be goddamned if I'll listen to you anymore. Only don't forget me. Remember, I warned you for your sake. Give me credit. Greater love hath no man than this, that he saveth his brother from himself. 
long day's journey into night, is set in the year 1912, the most decisive year of O'Neill's life. At least three of his most important plays take place during that year. 1912 was the year that began with his suicide attempt. Later that year, he began his first real job as a cub reporter on the New London Telegraph, where he also wrote a poetry column twice a week. The publisher of that paper was Frederick P. Latimer, a kindly elderly judge and a friend of his father's. He was the model for the father of the newspaper editor, Nat Miller, in our wilderness. Dear Mr. Nathan, you asked me when I decided to become a playwright. It was in 1912. That was the most significant year in my life. If I hadn't had an attack of tuberculosis, if I hadn't been forced then to look at myself harder than I've ever done before, I might never have become a playwright. On Christmas Day of 1912, he said goodbye to his mother and left for the Gaylord Sanatorium near Wallingford, Connecticut. There, the miracle happened. Cut off from every shred of the old life, forbidden to drink, put to bed at nine, O'Neill lay back, contemplated life for six months and came out at the end an artist. His restless spirit of creation had been cheated for half a dozen years by the easy excitement of dissipation. Now... Those ways meant death. And the spirit of creation turned to the great free space of the mind. At Gaylord, I really thought about life for the first time and became a regular bookworm at the sanatorium. I discovered the plays of August Strindberg. In reading Strindberg, I got the vision of what modern drama could be. It was he who first inspired me with the urge to write for the theater. He read Zola. Whitman. And above all, he read Nietzsche. Nietzsche became a tremendous influence on his thinking. His father was, was totally bewildered by his choice of reading, as was James Tyrone by Edmund's damned library. Where do you get your taste in authors? That damned library of yours. Voltaire, Rousseau, Schopenhauer, Nietzsche, Ibsen, atheist, fool, and madman. Poets. This Dowson and this Baudelaire and Swinburne, and Oscar Wilde, and Whitman, and Poe. Whoremongers and degenerates. When I've got three good sets of Shakespeare, I can read. They say he was a souse, too. They lie. I don't doubt he liked his glasses a good man's face. But he knew how to drink, so it didn't poison his brain with morbidness and filth. Now, don't compare him to that pack you got in there. Your dirty Zola. Your Dante Gabriel Rossetti was a dope feed. Perhaps it would be wise to change the subject. At the end of six months at Gaylord, he was found to be in good shape and released. His report read, discharged, condition arrested, prognosis excellent. Before I left Gaylord, I had made up my mind that I would rather write than do anything else. July 16th, 1914. Dear Sir, my ambition is to become a playwright, and I should like to enroll in your dramatic courses at Harvard University. I am 25 years old. I have written one long play and seven one-act plays. With my present training, I might hope to become a mediocre journeyman playwright. It is just because I do not wish to be one, because I want to be an artist or nothing, that I am writing to you. Well, I got into Baker's class. That's the time I thought I was God. I'd finish a play and rush it down to the post office to be copyrighted. After one year at Harvard, I moved to Greenwich Village. In the village, Jean became friends with Jack Reed, Louise Bryant, and others who spent their summers in Provincetown. And in June of 1916, he joined them on Cape Cod. That was the summer the Provincetown players were looking for material. And Bound East for Cardiff was there in his trunk. In the fall of that year, the Provincetown players left the Wharf Theater and settled in a new home on McDougal Street in Greenwich Village. During the next few years, stimulated by his association with the Provincetown players, who were ready and eager to produce his work, he wrote Long Voyage Home, Moon of the Caribbees, Emperor Jones, plus eight other plays. All of them but one were produced by the Provincetown players. Well, and if the Provincetown players gave O'Neill his opportunity, it's equally true that he gave them theirs. It was his plays that made the fame and fortune of the Provincetown. 
We go to Greenwich, where modern men itch to be free. I, I first met Mr. O'Neill on the uh, day that I came for a reading to see whether or not I could become a member of the Provincetown Players. That impressive head of O'Neill's was, you know, those eyes were like burning coals. And that strong jaw. And you were impressed beyond measure. And I was engaged uh, to become a member of the Provincetown Players. We had the reading of The Long Voyage Home. He asked if anyone knew the Swedish sing-song uh, language. And I said, yeah, I lived in Minnesota and I worked with the Swedish farmers. And he said, let's hear it. And I said, Svenska pojka, Jule flika. You're Olsen. And that was the beginning of uh, my career at the Provincetown. He never directed, but uh, O'Neill was always standing there, and you knew that presence, and that was the kind of thing that leavened uh, the theater. Magic uh, took place in this little barn here. Really magic. Greenwich Village was the heart of all that was new and radical in the arts and ideas on life and love, and the new freedom was celebrated. Jean's favorite hangouts were Polly's Restaurant, the Liberal Club, Romany Marie's, and especially the Golden Swan, better known as the Hell Hole. I came to Greenwich Village because I wanted to be a writer. And I met a man who said he wanted to be a playwright. It was at the hellhole that I met him. My friend Christine said, Agnes, this is Gene O'Neill. His father is James O'Neill, the famous actor. But Gene is completely broke. And all the time I felt his dark eyes looking at me. And I wondered more and more why he looked at me like that as though he had once known me somewhere. Now, he's got two one-act players over on McDougal Street at the Provincetown. You'll have to meet the Provincetown players. And there's Ida Rao, an actress. She's their doza. And Edna St. Vincent Millay. They call her Vincent. Her sister Norma is marvelous at comedy. She's engaged to Charles Ellis, one of the company's best actors. There was Jack Reed and his wife Louise Bryant, but they've gone off to Russia to help with the revolution. Jean was in love with Louise. Mm. So you know something? You look a lot like Louise. He told me how proud he was of his mother and father. And how he wanted to make up to them for all the things he'd done in the past. To make them proud of him. That we would do that, he and I. He talked of his love of the sea and his hatred for drink because of what it did to his brain. And he asked me to marry him. Oh, love of my life, we need nothing, you and I, but ourselves. I want it to be not you and me, but us, in an aloneness broken by nothing, not even by children of our own. And this must be my life, our life, from now on. I always remember his words that first evening we met. I want to spend every night of my life from now on with you. Every night of my life. We spent as much time as we could on a lonely stretch of coastline near Provincetown called Peak Till Bar, surrounded by water and dunes. station that Jean's father bought for us. It was miles from Provincetown. I feel a truth. 
true kinship and harmony with life out here. Sand and sun and sea and wind, you merge into them and become as meaningless and as full of meaning as they are, and you know that you are alone. My love, we will live here like seagulls. Two seagulls coming back at night to our home. Dear Kenneth, on October 30th, 1919, we had a son, Shane Rudreg O'Neill, a ten and a half pound boy who looks able to play football right now and who has a voice that carries further than the old man's. That same year, O'Neill sent me a copy of a three-act tragedy called Beyond the Horizon. It was probably the most important new full-length drama by an American. It summed up all his early years as a playwright. I immediately took the play to John D. Williams, the leading Broadway producer, whose work I respected. And Williams, after one reading in one of the most rapid transactions in show business, sent O'Neill a check for $500 for a six-month option. O'Neill was absolutely elated. The leading role played by Richard Bennett is that of an imaginary farm boy who writes poetry and longs to see the world. Because of his love for a girl, he stays on the farm and allows his brother to go to sea in his place. This is the tragedy of a man who looks over the horizon, who longs with his whole soul to depart on the quest, but whom destiny confines to one place. I knew this man, a born sailor, who kept telling me he should have stayed home on the farm instead of going to sea. I thought, what if he had stayed on the farm? What would have happened? O'Neill's theme is that we all belong to some greater force, and if we resist that force and betray our real nature, we court disaster. In January 1920, the play was put into rehearsal to open as a series of matinees at the Morosco Theater. This period of rehearsal was O'Neill's first experience with the so-called professional Broadway theater. He wrote to Agnes in Provincetown. We are now in our second week of rehearsals, and I found many cuts to make. Honestly, I've learned a tremendous lot that I wouldn't miss for worlds. January 14th, my dearest Aggie. I'm so tired and deathly sick of hearing and seeing beyond that I wish I were in hell. I don't think there's a chance in the world of the play being a success. Today we rehearsed in the men's toilet while they put up the sets. I have the flu, I have terrible insomnia, and I'm as busy as a centipede with St. Vitus dance. My own... There's a big spread in front of the Morosco Theater that says Eugene O'Neill's first long play. My God, the opening is less than a week away. Will I survive it? <laughs> On a cold February afternoon in 1920, a showwise audience assembled at the Morosco Theater to witness the premiere of Beyond the Horizon. At the final curtain, the audience was very quiet. They left the theater with tears in their eyes. Later, backstage, James O'Neill approached his son. It's all right, if that's what you want to do. But people come to the theater to forget the troubles, not to be reminded of them. What are you trying to do, send them all home to commit suicide? Play big artistic success. Great notices all papers. Three cheers for you and beyond, and much love. In theater arts, I wrote, an almost perfect tragedy. The New York Telegraph. This new American tragedy is one of the best New York has been fortunate enough to see in many a season. My own review. Beyond the Horizon will probably influence the future course of American drama. Its honest realism comes as a revelation to the Broadway theater that up to now has given itself over to a rhinestone imagination. Beyond the Horizon went on to win O'Neill his first Pulitzer Prize. I thought the prize was some wooden medal or something. When I heard it was a thousand dollars, I nearly fell into the ocean. But in June of that same year, James O'Neill went home to New London to die of cancer. His death received good notices in all the papers. James O'Neill closed an era in the American theater. So at the age of 33, O'Neill was a famous dramatist. 
But his greatest successes and his most ambitious failures still lay before him. He knew better than anyone that he was just beginning, just beginning. Soon, he was to try bolder experiments. Masks, tom-toms, asides. In the future, I intend to use whatever I can make my own to write the truth as I know it, or better still, feel it. I don't love life because it's pretty. I am a truer lover than that. I love it naked. There is beauty to me even in its ugliness. So in my future work, I will dare. And I say, let the splinters fly wherever they may. Oh, there is so much I have yet to say. Eugene O'Neill, A Glory of Ghosts, will return after this brief intermission. <laughs>